evening, folks. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dennis and Jenny DeGroat, who are going to welcome us uh, to this meeting. Well, good evening. It's a beautiful evening here at Swallowfield Farm, and we are um, thrilled and honored to be able to uh, welcome you, even though it's online. Swallowfield Farm is a place that we call home, but it was home to the Kwantlen, Katsi, the Matsqui, and Semiamu First Nations well before we came to live here. We recognize that much must be still done to repair what is broken on these unceded territories. It is our hope that Swallowfield is a place of healing, of learning and sharing, of growing and preserving, a place of restoration. We were so thrilled at the opportunity to host Catherine at Swallowfield, and it does remain our hope that one day we will be able to host her in person. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a mother scientist, decorated professor, and member of the Potawatomi First Nation. She's the author of Braiding Sweetgrass. Some of you may have read Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. And she says, until we can grieve for our planet, we cannot love it. Grieving is a sign of spiritual health, but it is not enough to weep for our lost landscapes. We have to put our hands in the earth to make ourselves whole again. Even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. She says, I choose joy over despair. In having read and listened to Catherine, it feels as if we are encountering someone who believes that we do need to grieve, but then to get on with the tasks of healing the work of wonder and a life of joy. Welcome. So I'm uh, David Clements. I'm the Assistant Dean of Research at Trinity Western University. And I'm very pleased to host this talk by Catherine Hayhoe as part of our Supporting Structures grant, which was given to us by um, Scholarship and Christianity in Oxford. And we are just uh, thrilled because the theme of our grant is sustainability, and they've given us three years to uh, use the, the funding, um, but hopefully this will be sustainability into the future as we learn from people like Catherine about how to sustain our world. And right now I'm on Salt Spring Island with uh, 18 students, and we are all learning more about sustaining the planet. So this lecture comes just at the right time. So thank you very much, Catherine. My name is Rick Faw, and I'm the Education Director for Arasha Canada. And Arasha, if you've not heard of Arasha, is a global family of Christian organizations working together to live out God's calling to care for creation and equip others to do likewise. There are projects in about 20 countries around the world. And in Canada, we have hubs of activity in BC and Manitoba and in Ontario. And Arasha started 40 years ago uh, in Portugal, and that's how we got the name. Arasha means the rock in Portuguese. We'd love it if you uh, were to check us out. So to do that, you can go to arasha.ca or arasha.org to find out more. And tonight, we are delighted to contribute to this partnership that put everything together. And in particular, we're grateful for Catherine's willingness to add one more event to her schedule this weekend. So we're really looking forward to the discussion. Hello, on behalf of Regent College, I'm delighted to co-sponsor tonight's event with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who's doing such important work to bring hope and healing to our world. My name is David Robinson, and I direct Regent's MA program in Leadership, Theology, and Society. We designed this degree so that leaders, from scientists to business people, could stay in their workplaces while completing a graduate degree in theology over a two-year period. With a low residency cohort model, we're equipping today's leaders for conversations about climate change and the other issues that matter most to our societies. We welcome you to join us. For more information about the MA in Leadership, Theology and Society, visit rgnt.net slash malts. Thank you and enjoy tonight's event. Hello, my name is Judy Taranchuk. I'm retired professor from Trinity Western, but tonight I'm representing the Graduate and Faculty Christian Forum at UBC, uh, which I'm also a part of. This is an interdisciplinary group dedicated to providing discussion on how faith interacts with scholarship. 
by engaging with graduate students and faculty. We invite top scholars from around the globe, such as Catherine Hayhoe and others from local institutions to stretch our thinking on faith, science, and culture from a broad interdenominational Christian viewpoint. We discuss the claims of Christianity and its reasonableness under intellectual scrutiny. We have free monthly lectures organized on campus and open to anyone, although they're specifically targeted to faculty and grad students. And um, in addition, all of our lectures are now hybrid and posted online to allow general public participation. Check out the website. Thank you, Catherine, for coming. And good evening, folks. My name is Arnold Sikama. I'm a physics professor at Trinity Western University, and I'm also the executive director of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. And so I'm glad you're here uh, as, uh, and taking in this event. So the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation is an organization of, of scientists across this country who are Christians and are thinking about their work uh, in all disciplines, including disciplines relating to, uh, to science like history of science, philosophy of science, theology relating to science, how our work in science re uh, is related to our Christian worldview. And we are having our 50th anniversary this year, so you can attend a conference uh, in, in Toronto this summer. Uh, it's our annual conference with the American Scientific Affiliation. There's information and links there. There's our social media handles. And we'd love for you to, if, especially if you're a scientist or if you're a science student, uh, and if, or if you know someone who is and want to get them connected with a network to mentor, uh, to provide mentorship and, and resources for, for students working through matters of science and faith. And this is a great network for them to get connected with and students can join for free. Uh, and others can also just uh, sign up to be informed about where the events are um, happening in, in their vicinity or online as well. So. Thank you for joining us. And we, um, the those five of us here, the Trin Trinity Western Regent, Arosha, uh, the Graduate and Faculty Christian Forum, and CSEA are the co-sponsors for tonight's uh, for tonight's talk. So we're so grateful uh, to Catherine for being willing to uh, add uh, this event to her schedule for this weekend. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Catherine to you all, and then uh, she'll speak. Catherine is a friend of many of us here in the Vancouver area. She's spoken. Uh, in person, of course, uh, at, at Trinity Western uh, uh, events put on on campus here at, in 2014, as well as at Regent and Arosha in, in 2015. She spoke for an event organized by CSEA and Trinity Western in 2018, and a number of other events uh, online as well. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding the impacts of climate change on people and the planet. She's the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, which is in Canada, called Nature United where she leads and coordinates the organization's scientific efforts. She's a tenured professor at Texas Tech University and has received numerous awards and recognitions for her work, including being named a United Nations Champion of the Earth and including being named a Fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation, which is that Canadian, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation is the Canadian expression of the American Scientific Affiliation. And she's a member and fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation. So uh, with that, thank you very much for uh, being willing to join us, Catherine. We really look forward to your uh, to your talk, and uh, we will uh, have a great time of conversation uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arnold, and thank you everyone who is here. Uh, it is great to be with you, and we are going to be interacting with each other a little bit. I'm just going to put a link in the chat there so you have that information because I'm going to be speaking, but then you get to ask questions, and we have a lot of time at the end to take your questions. So as you know, I'm a climate scientist. And the reason why I'm a climate scientist is very relevant to this group that we find ourselves with today. It is because of my faith. So I grew up in a home where science was part of what we did. My dad was a science teacher. And so I knew I always wanted to study science because who wouldn't want to understand how the universe works? But I, my undergraduate degree is actually in physics and astronomy from the University of Toronto. And I was planning to be an astrophysicist until to finish up my degree, I needed a breadth requirement. And this is an argument for our system where we require students to take breadth requirements. Because I looked around and there was this brand new class on climate change over in the geography department. And I thought, well, that looks interesting. Why not take it? So I took this class 
And that's where I learned three things that completely surprised me and that basically changed the trajectory of my life. The first thing I learned is that climate science and specifically climate modeling, which is the type of science I do, is the exact same physics and even some of the same astronomy that I had been learning. I'm not sure what I thought it was, but I didn't think it was that. Turns out it is. I also learned, however, that climate change is not a future issue. It's already an urgent issue. And I learned this 25 years ago. So I'd always thought of it as, oh, you know, people will take care of it when it turns into a problem. But I learned through taking that class that it's a problem today. But what really changed my perspective was when I realized climate change affects all of us, but it doesn't affect us all equally. It affects the people who are most vulnerable more than anyone else. And that is not fair. The poorest and most vulnerable people, the people who are most impacted by climate change, <clears throat> they're the ones who've done the least to contribute to the problem. So that's when I realized I have to do everything I can to help fix this problem. And that's why I became a climate scientist. So that connects directly to my faith. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight isn't so much about what we believe. It's much more about how we communicate on it. But the reason why I am a climate scientist is because I truly believe that we are called to love each other as we have been loved ourselves by God. And how loving is it to basically put our hands over our ears or over our eyes and pretend that we do not see the suffering that's being inflicted on our neighbors today, right next to us, as well as on people on the other side of the world. So that's what motivates me to study this issue. But what I'm going to be speaking to you tonight about is what we can do. And what we can do is very surprising. In fact, to be totally honest, it surprised me. I'm going to be talking about how we can have effective conversations why that matters and how that can make a difference. But first of all, I want to hear from you. So go ahead and if you have a phone, you can do this on your phone, you can do it on your computer, you can click on the link I put in the chat. Go to pollev.com slash Catherine. If you're going to type it in, you have to spell Catherine correctly. It's got two A's. Or you can just scan the QR code with your phone. That's the easy way to do it. And when you go there, I'm going to start off by asking you a very easy question. You can answer this question just by tapping with your finger. Where are you joining us from today? Now, I know we're online, so not everybody's from Canada, and that is okay, we forgive you. You can just click off the edge in whatever direction you're coming from. So if you are down in the States, click down below. If you're coming from over in Europe, you can click over on the side, over in Asia, click on that side. Where are you joining us from today? <clears throat> it looks like we have a pretty solid BC contingent, no surprise, given who's hosting this. We have somebody up in the Yukon, it looks like. We got Alberta, Ontario, somebody just over the border in Quebec. Excellent. Good representation all around up the Central Valley. Oh, there's somebody south of the border. Welcome. Looks like we got somebody from Ottawa joining us. You don't have to be too precise. This is not a geography test. <laughs> you will not be graded on where your finger lands, especially if you're on your phone. I know it's hard to get the finger in the right place. So, you know, if you can just aim for the right side or the left side, that's totally fine. I'm admiring the precision of all the people who are aiming at Vancouver and Surrey and Langley there. You're getting right on the nose. All right. So it looks like we have a very strong BC contingent. All right. Now I'm going to ask you another question. And this question, I need you to answer with one word. Not two words, just one word. And the next question I want to ask you is this. When I say climate change, how do you feel? One word. Anxious, concerned, uncertain, terrified, uneasy, sad, overwhelmed, nervous, guilty, compelled. I first asked people this question, the very first talk I gave after my book, Saving Us, came out a year and a half ago. Because I'd been listening to a number of psychologists, and a lot of psychologists were saying, you know, we're starting too far down the road. We really have to start where we are, and where we are is how we feel about this. So the very first time I was speaking to people after my book came out, it was a group of moms at a science museum in Utah, and of course it was online, everything was online, it was during the pandemic too. And I asked them this, and you know what? 
I got pretty much the same answers as you just gave me. Anxious, sad, overwhelmed, concerned, frustrated, angry, disheartened, terrified. And no wonder. Because when we look back in history, when we look back as far as we can in the paleoclimate record, we do not have any analog for what's happening today. We know it's been warmer before, and we know it's been cooler before, but we didn't have 8 billion people on the planet when that was happening, and it wasn't happening this fast. The closest analog we can find to what's happening today, at that time, one-tenth of the carbon was going into the atmosphere naturally as we are putting in today as humans. There is no analog for the rapid speed of change. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their final uh, big synthesis report just came out a couple of months ago. They've showed that climate is changing faster than any time, and this is the important part, we've seen. It isn't about saving the planet, it is about us, us humans. We are not used to what's happening today. And so if you feel worried, you should. I'm worried, I'm a climate scientist. If you feel anxious, you should. I'm anxious too. In fact, the more I know, the more anxious we get. So if you feel this way, it is completely logical. Now, often we refer to what we see as global warming, but then along comes a cold day and people say, well, where's global warming now? I prefer to call this global weirding because how you and I see this is not through global temperature. You know, our brains aren't capable of adding up the temperature at every different weather station around the world and then averaging it across the whole planet and then fitting a trend line over 20 years. But our brains are definitely capable of seeing how things are getting weirder. And the way I think about it is, wherever you live, it's as if you have a pair of dice and we naturally have a chance of rolling a double six sometimes, right? A storm, a flood, a drought, a heat wave, that's just natural. But as the world warms decade by decade, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking one of these numbers and turning it into a six and taking another number and turning it into a six and taking another number and turning it into a seven. And all of a sudden we're saying, hey, we just had three 500 year flood events in three years. What is going on? So a few years ago, I was standing in line to pick up my son at Sunday school. And um, there was a man behind me waiting and he said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And I said, well, of course. I mean, we're just sitting here anyways, right? So he said, do you feel like the weather is getting weirder? Now, just for context, I live in Lubbock, which won the Weather Channel's weirdest weather competition 10 years ago. So we live in a place that has the weirdest weather pretty much in the entire United States. And he was asking me if the weather was getting weirder. But being a scientist, I had crunched the data. And I said, you know, yeah, you could say that because our heat waves are getting stronger. They're coming earlier in the year. Our droughts are getting longer. Our heavy rainfall is getting more intense. And he said, I knew it. I've lived here for 30 years and I could tell that something was different. And if you've lived somewhere, I bet you can tell something's different too. So let's go back to those questions and give me one more word again, just one word. Now you got the hang of it, right? What kind of extreme weather do you feel like you have seen climate change make worse? And it won't be the same answer because everybody has different, different experiences. You live in different places. So we've got heat waves, we've got flooding, we've got fires, we've got thunderstorms, we've got floods, we've got heat domes, wildfires. See, and if I ask people this question in Texas, we would definitely see hurricanes up there. We would see droughts up there. Wherever we live, we have our own set of dice and climate change is loading our dice against us. Not only is this happening, but, oh, somebody put in hurricanes there. All right. Not only is this happening, but at the cutting edge of climate science, we are starting to be able to put numbers on how much worse climate change made a specific event. Before, 10 years ago, when a reporter called and said, you know, what does climate change have to do with the wildfires in Alberta? I would say, well, we can't attribute any one event to human influence, but we know that over time, the area burned by wildfires is increasing as hot and dry weather is getting more frequent. But today we can actually put numbers on specific events. 
we know that our droughts are getting more intense, our heat waves are getting more dangerous, our wildfires are burning greater area, our hurricanes are dumping a lot more rain and they're stronger. And when we look at events like the floods in 2021, you remember that, the terrible floods that just went on and on, it kept raining and raining. We know that climate change made those floods at least twice as likely. So when you're rolling those dice, you could have rolled those floods naturally, but the chances of rolling the floods are now twice as high thanks to climate change. Why is that? Because warmer air holds more water vapor. Atmospheric rivers are getting stronger. Atmospheric rivers are sweeping across the ocean, picking up all that extra water vapor, dumping it on the West Coast. What about the wildfires like the ones that we're seeing today? You saw the smoke in the air, I saw it too. A study just came out last week. Now, actually, <clears throat> let me back up. We already know that with these wildfires that we've experienced in the past, studies have shown that they're burning seven to 10 times the area than they would otherwise because of issues like the beetles that are overwintering because of warm winters eating the trees. So there's a lot more dead trees. We also know the hot and dry weather is causing more area to be burned. So we've known for a number of years that the area being burned in BC and out West is significantly larger than it would be otherwise. But last week, a brand new study came out that went further. A study found that of all of the forests burned across Southwestern Canada, which includes BC obviously, and the Western US, 37% of the area burned can be attributed not just to climate change, the number for climate change is bigger, 37% can be attributed to the 88 biggest producers of heat trapping gas emissions. Because they can add up how much each company has produced and they can add up how much that's contributed to overall climate change. And then they can add up what percent of the forest fires have been burned because of climate change in general and then what percent because of those emissions. So we are connecting the dots directly between cause and effect these days. Remember the heat wave and the wildfires in 2021, where the town of Lytton broke the all time Canadian high temperature record. And they just broke another one for May just the other day, actually. They broke it once, twice, three times in a row. And then on the fourth day, most of the town was burned down by wildfire. We know that that heat wave was 150 times more likely because of climate change. So this is what we know. We know that this is happening. And it's not just happening out in BC, it's happening in Toronto, it's happening in Ottawa. We're seeing the floods, we're seeing the heat waves, it's happening out on the East Coast. We're seeing invasive species spreading into Canada, we're seeing sea level rising, we're seeing health impacts from the heat waves and the wildfire smoke. Wherever we live, we are being affected today, it is no longer a future issue, we see it in our headlines every week. And why do we care? We care because it's quite literally affecting the air we breathe. It's affecting the water that we drink. It affects the food that we eat. It affects the buildings and the roads and the infrastructure that we need. It affects the nature that surrounds us. So we know why this is happening too. A new study that just came out two days ago put numbers on the damages being caused by climate change and took those backwards to the companies and estimated how much specific companies that last year made record-breaking profits, the biggest profits oil and gas companies have ever made were made last year. And this new study that just came out, led by Richard Heed, a very interesting guy who analyzes the amount of emissions attributable to each different um, company, it showed that $209 billion a year is what fossil fuel companies owe for reparations for the damages that all of us are suffering. So when you feel sad and anxious and concerned and hopeless, that is a completely rational response to what is going on. And I wanna tell you this too, you are not alone. This past year, when they asked Canadians, this is the most recent study I could find from about six months ago, they asked Canadians, are you worried about climate change? 
70% of us are worried. So if you're worried, you are not alone. 70% of us are worried. If you wanna break this down, this breaks it down by province, also by age, male, female, urban, suburban, highlight BC there. 74% of people in BC are worried. In Alberta, 59%, that number is probably gonna tick up after this year. In Ontario, 72%. More women than men are worried. More urban than rural people are worried. More young people, 18 to 34, 79% of young people are worried. When you look at the United States, this is the percentage of people who are worried over time in the US from 2008 to 2022. You can see it bounces around up and down, but the numbers are just below Canadian numbers. And when we look across the world, this is a study by Yale that asked people, are you worried about climate change? And you can see we're a bit more worried than the states, but there's a lot of countries who are a lot more worried than us. Most of South America, most of Central America, India, a lot of Europe, which has experienced devastating heat waves and droughts last summer. Many people are very worried about climate change. If you're wondering about the gray areas, they weren't surveyed. And I mentioned before, but I wanna emphasize again, this is not about saving the planet. The planet itself is gonna be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It is about us, us living things, us and all the plants and animals that share this planet with us, we are not used to such rapid change. We are not accustomed to it. We're not adapted to it. Everything we have was built for a planet that no longer exists. All of our buildings, our roads, our infrastructure, our agriculture, the way that we've parceled out our water, even our geopolitical boundaries are all built for a planet that doesn't exist. And these issues affect us all, but they don't affect us all equally. If you look, at who produces most of the emissions, the poorest 50% of people on the planet, the poorest 4 billion people on the planet have produced 7% of the heat trapping gas emissions. Yet, if you look at the list of which countries are suffering the most from global weirding, from climate change loading the weather dice against us, the red are the lowest income countries, Malawi, Somalia, Mozambique, Sudan, Madagascar. We've got Australia in there, we've got the US in there, but the majority are countries that have done little to nothing to contribute to the problem. And the bottom line is that's not fair. So this begs the question, what can we do about it? And often we assume that if people just knew the facts, they would change their minds, right? Because this is pretty bad. I mean, I've gone through how it's affecting us, how it's affecting the poorest people in the world, who is responsible, how we know. I haven't gotten into the science of how we know it's not volcanoes or the sun or natural cycles. I talked about that last time I was at Trinity Western, but I have some great global weirding episodes that do. And actually, Mark, maybe you could put a link there in the chat to uh, globalweirdingseries.com. We've looked at the science for over 150 years and we know that humans are responsible. It is not natural. And if people just knew how it's affecting us today, surely they change their minds, right? Well, we know that we have the facts in the scientific literature. We've got, actually, this is a bit of an old number. We've got almost 3 million scientific studies on climate change. We've got six full sets of IPCC reports so big that if you stacked them all up, they'd reach past your ceiling. We've communicated these facts in many ways with many experts. A couple of years ago, I was one of 11,000 scientists who signed a letter warning of the climate emergency. And we've been communicating this for a really long time. We have known since the 1800s that digging up and burning coal back then and oil and gas today produces heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. We've known that since the 1850s. By the 1890s, Svante Arrhenius, who is a chemist from Sweden, who is actually a distant cousin of Greta Thunberg's, he was calculating by hand just how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. And he was right. He calculated the first climate model by hand in the 1890s. 
for fun. He was busy winning the Nobel Prize in physical chemistry, and that was what he was doing on the side. And then by the 1930s, Guy Callender, who was born in Canada, so we will claim him, although he was a British citizen, Guy Callender rode around the world and collected all of the thermometer and temperature data for the last 50 years and showed that the world was indeed warming as the result of burning coal, gas, and oil. By the 1960s, scientists were so worried about this that they were warning U.S. presidents of the needs to act, Lyndon B. Johnson. By the 1970s, scientists working for Exxon and Shell and Ford were telling the company what the result of their business choices was going to be. And today we have scientists out everywhere. We have scientists speaking out. We have scientists chaining themselves to banks. We have scientists all over social media. We have scientists sharing this message everywhere. But here's the thing. If we truly had a problem with the science that explains why climate is changing, and all of you who have physics will understand what I mean, then we would also have a problem with the way airplanes fly, the way stoves and fridges heat and cool food because thermodynamics and radiative transfer are the basic science that we need to understand how digging up and burning coal and gas and oil produces heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere and they're wrapping that extra blanket around the planet causing it to warm. The physics is so basic that we've known it for over 150 years. So where did the objections come from? Where did they start? It turns out that, well, how do we know it's real? Isn't it just a natural cycle or volcanoes? Aren't those scientists just in it for the money? It's too expensive to fix it anyways. It'll just be fine. We'll adapt. When did these arguments begin? They began 30 years ago. They began when the impacts of climate change first became obvious in the late 80s, when the first IPCC report came out in 1990, when the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in 1992. The objections began when it looked like we had to do something about it. And this is really important because so many of the objections we hear are couched in sciencey sounding terms. But we have good answers for those. And if people want the answers, they exist. There's a wonderful resource called Skeptical Science. It was created by John Cook. And it has an answer to over 200 but what about questions about climate change has a short answer, a long answer, and a very long answer with links to all the scientific papers. If people really want answers to the but what about questions, those answers are there. But what I've realized in thousands of conversations I've had with people in real life and online is that those sciencey sounding objections are typically smoke screens for the real problem. The real problem for many people is I don't want to fix it because I don't know what any solutions look like that wouldn't harm me, and I don't even think it matters to me anyways. So when we address the science sounding objections, when we address the misinformation, it's like we're playing the whack-a-mole game at the CNE for me in Toronto, or whatever fair it is that you go to. You know, like you hit one and it just pops up another. It's because we have to address the real problems. And the real problems, and this relates directly to how to have effective conversations, the real problems are that we don't understand why it matters so urgently to us personally. And we don't know what the solutions look like anyways, other than being couched in terms of loss. You can't eat this, you can't do that, you can't go there, you can't travel this, you can't have a child. Can't, 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 can't. And you're like, well, my life is gonna be better off if I just pretend this doesn't exist. So let's unpack these two issues. They actually have names. The first one's called psychological distance and the second one's called solution aversion. Let's unpack these to understand what they look like. So the first one, I don't understand why it matters to me. It turns out that we humans are really, really good at pushing away things that we feel like we can't do anything about. You know, who of us, and I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, I'm not gonna pull anybody, but who of us really stands up every 30 minutes and walks around all the time? right? Who of us really eats only what we're supposed to eat and never what we're not supposed to eat, right? Who drinks as much water as they're supposed to? Who walks as many steps as they're supposed to? We don't have any problems with this. We all know it's good and we should be doing it. Well, why aren't we? We see the risk as being distant. Oh, we'll worry about that later. This, we see every single one of these come into play when it comes to climate change. Distant in time and space, abstract, 
global average temperature rather than my life. And oh, it just is, it matters to those people. not. So I shared earlier these results from the US about people who are worried. And you can see, first of all, that they're just a little bit below the Canadian numbers. But then they asked a different question. They said, do you think it affects you? And they got the dark red line. So here's the people who are worried, but more than a third of them don't think it will matter to them. Well, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? So I'm going to show you some maps for the U.S. Unfortunately, we don't have these maps for Canada, but I think we sort of we track the U.S. just slightly above. All the data I have for Canada basically shows that if you take the U.S., shift it up about 5%, and that's Canada. So most people across the U.S. and Canada agree it's real. Anywhere that's orange is more than 50%, and the darker orange, the more people said yes. Most people agree it will harm plants and animals. Where is the psychological distance there? In relevance, non-human species, right? Oh, non-human species, sure, it'll affect them. What about future generations? That's people in the future. Yeah, it'll affect people in the future, not me. What about people who live over there? Sure, it'll affect people who live over there, not me. And then the researcher said, will it affect you? Look at that. Massive difference. And if you're wondering what the orange counties are, there's two people groups in the US who are most concerned about climate change. Those two people groups are Hispanic Catholics and indigenous peoples and Native Americans. So that's where you see the orange there. So the first thing we have to do is we have to bring this issue to now, not the future, to here, not the polar bears over there. We have to make it concrete, not global average temperature, but global weirding, the flood in my backyard, the wildfire smoke that I am breathing into my lungs. And we have to show how it's relevant to me, my home, my life, my health, our city, our province. But we also have to talk about the second half of the coin. Because so often, solutions are couched in terms of such loss and sacrifice that most people conclude, I'd rather just, you know, continue on my life as, as long as I can, because that sounds miserable. People want solutions that give us a better life and a better world, not a worse one. But you know what? I'm absolutely convinced that climate solutions will give us a better world. And I don't think there's any way to get to that better world without overcoming the challenge of climate change. The second thing I've learned, too, is that people are willing to change if they think that what they do can make a difference. And today we don't think that what we can do can make a difference. I'm so careful with my travel. I bundle like crazy when I travel in person. I do most of my events virtually. And then over the pandemic, I heard about how they were they were flying 3000 empty flights just to keep their gate assignments. I'm like, what? This is just pointless. Why am I even doing this? And we all have this feeling, don't we? We feel like we can try as hard as we can to take personal actions. And then we just hear about people massively wasting huge amounts of energy, huge amounts of food, just totally, totally blowing through the carbon budget. So this relates to the second part of my title. And this is the most common question that I get today. In fact, it's so common that this is the reason why I wrote my book, Saving Us. I wrote it because wherever I went, no matter who I was speaking to, I could be speaking to healthcare professionals in Ontario. I could be speaking to 10th grade kids in Saskatchewan. I could be speaking to Catholic nuns in upstate New York. I could be speaking to Netflix employees in California. No matter who I was speaking with, when I used Poll Everywhere for people to ask me their questions, the number one question that would rise to the top of the list is this, what gives you hope? So I had to dig into this. What does give us hope? And I want to be very clear that hope is not just sort of wishing that everything will be okay. I don't know if you read this book when you were little. I did. And it's about sort of relentless positivity. Well, relentless positivity might make you feel better for a little bit if you can keep it up but it's not gonna fix climate change. And hiding your head in the sand like the mythical ostrich, not the real one, that's not gonna do it either. If we just sort of think positive thoughts about this issue, you know, it might just sort of keep you happier while the Titanic sinks. 
That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the type of hope we need. That's false hope. What we need is we need real hope. And so I had to think, well, what is real hope? Think about this. Do you need hope when everything's going well? No. When everything's going fine, you don't need hope. If you're not worried about anything, if everything's rosy, if the future looks great, you don't need hope. When do you need hope? You need hope when things aren't going well. And it begins by saying it's bad and it could get worse. Success is not inevitable or even entirely probable. But what is hope? Hope is the chance, however small, that if we do everything we can, we can make a difference. There is a better future possible and there is a way to get there. And ironically, it turns out that this is exactly the science I do. The science that I do that I ended up in because I had a background in physics and I took that class on climate change, the science I ended up in is modeling the outcome of our choices. That's the science I do. And so I look at what happens if we continue to depend on fossil fuels. I look at what's already happened since the Paris Agreement and we've had significant changes since the Paris Agreement. Did you know that 10 years ago we were headed for a world that was gonna be four and a half degrees Celsius warmer than we were used to? And today we're headed for a world that is likely to be 2.7 degrees warmer. Now that's not at 1.5 yet, which is where we'd prefer to be, the lower the better, but we've already made a big chunk of progress, but now we need more. So I look at what would happen if we end up at 2.7. I look at what would happen if we end up at two or one and a half. And it turns out that there is one factor that makes the biggest difference. And you know what that one factor is? us. Our decisions are what make the difference between those different futures. And if we decide that we're doomed, what's going to happen? Nothing. We are going to do nothing and we're going to end up at the highest possible scenario with the biggest catastrophes. But if we realize that it is literally our choices that determine where we lie on that spectrum, that gives us the hope that we need to act. Now, all too often we think, and I thought myself, you know, when we're talking about climate action, you know, we've got David Suzuki, right? He's still going. We've got Elizabeth May, right? We've got Catherine McKenna. We've got Greta Thunberg. And of course, the polar bears care too. We think, well, when it comes to climate action, these people have it covered. You know, so what, why do we need me? We need everybody. And to quote Greta, she said, the one thing we need more than hope is action because, and this is really cool, and this fits very well with the psychology that psychologists are studying about motivation. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. They even tell you things like, don't wait to go to the gym until you feel like going, go to the gym, and then after you've gone to the gym, you'll feel like going, right? It's the same with action. Once we actually do something, and the organizations who are here have tons of things that you can do. I know Arasha has amazing things you can do, Brookfield Farm has things you can do, um, Trinity Western, you've got things that people can do. Once you add your hand, that's where we find the hope. So when I talk to people, I share the hopeful news of the science, and this is literally the conclusions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every choice matters. It matters what we do. So how do we tackle these issues of psychological distance? I don't think it matters, and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, going back to the data I shared, it turns out it reveals the first step. There is a very concrete first step. And that first step is so simple that for years we just skipped right over it. We just skipped right over the first step because we just took it so for granted. We jumped right away to the changing the light bulbs or the reducing food waste. But we left off here. Do you think global warming will harm you personally? There's one map that's darker blue, and I've looked at results for Canada, and I can tell you they're not that different. Again, just bump them up 5% and you got the same for us. They asked them one more question. Do you ever talk about it? Do you ever talk about it? No. And here you go. Here's the international map. Do you ever talk about it? Do you hear about it once a week? We don't look so great, do we? We are slightly, I mean, we're in the 40 to 50% category. We're slightly higher than the US, but not much. 
And here's why this matters. If you don't talk about something, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you ever do anything about it? Talking about it's the first step. So then people say, okay, well, if you want me to talk about it, and I've heard this from many people, here's me and everybody I know, and most of the people here, we're worried, right? We're in that dark green over there. But everybody else, they don't wanna talk about it, so they're not worried. So here's what I'm gonna do. Climate's changing, we're worried. So I'm gonna load up on all the scary facts that I can get, and there's plenty of very real scary facts. Sea level's rising twice as fast as it was 25 years ago. Wildfires are burning more area. Atmospheric rivers are stronger. We know all this is happening, and then we share it with people. But what happens? People just pull the covers back over their head. Why is this? Well, Tally Sherratt is a neuroscientist, and she says, talking in general, not just about climate change, she says, fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. We think that this is where people are at, but what I just showed you makes it clear they're not. Where people really are is here. It turns out only a tiny fraction of us are activated. In the US, the number is 8%. Canada, maybe 10 or 12%. Most people are worried. And so is making worried people who are paralyzed more worried going to help? No, they're already worried. What do people who are worried need? They need to understand not just what's in their heads, all that worries in your head. You have to connect what's in your head to your heart. Why does it matter to me? And then, this is key, connect the heart to the hands. What can I do about it? They need to understand how it affects us here and now and what real solutions look like and how we can make a difference. So what do we need to talk about? We need to talk about the heart and about the hands, about what's happening that matters to us and about what we can do to fix it. So I was um, speaking to a group of people in Iowa last year, and they, we got to this point and somebody had a question. They said, okay, I'm tracking, we need to talk. But how do you talk about polar bears in Iowa? And I said, you don't. Not unless there's some secret population of polar bears that we don't know about that was probably illegally exported from Canada. You do not talk about polar bears in Iowa. What do you talk about? Well, when I'm in Texas, I talk about cotton farming with Jack, who hasn't had a decent harvest since 2005 and his family has been farming the land for 120 years. My friend Joellen in Arizona talks about how she has to wake up her kids before dawn in the summer, otherwise it's too hot for them to play outside. If we're in the city, we can talk about how that flood happened, and the impact that it had on us. We can talk about how it's affecting the nature that we love. We can talk about how it's affecting the snow that we love. Either we have not enough or too much of it. And both of those are, yes, global weirding. To care about climate change, you don't have to be a certain type of person. We don't have to make somebody the same person we are. If I care because I'm a birder, I don't have to make everyone else a birder to care. I just have to figure out what it is that they care about. And so often I try to figure out, well, what do I have in common with somebody? Do they like science like I like science? Are they Canadian like I'm Canadian? Do they live in Texas like I live in Texas? Do they love skiing like I love skiing? Are they a mom like I am? Are they a Christian like I am? Do they knit like I do? <laughs> do they like beach vacations like I do? I care about climate change because of who I am. And I'm absolutely convinced that every single person on this planet, as long as they have someone they love, somewhere they love, something they love, they have every reason they need to care about climate change too. I know people who care because they're a gardener. I know people who care because they're a hiker. I know people who care because they served in the military. Whoever you are, you're the perfect person to care. So go back to that poll everywhere now, keeping you on target here. Go back to poll everywhere and give me one word now. I want you to tell me in one word, I care about climate change because I am a what? What are you? that makes you somebody who cares about climate change. You care because you're a mom. I care because I'm a mom too. I, I, you care because you're a biologist. I care too because I'm a scientist. 
Oh, a horticulturalist, an artist, a person, a teacher. I love that. A dad, a young person, a physician, a grandfather. Yes, climate change is affecting beer and wine. So if you're a drinker, then yes, you definitely care about climate change. It's part of why I care too. I love this huge variety that we're seeing here. And this is exactly my point. Whoever we are, we're the perfect person to care and we're the perfect person to help other people see how they are also the perfect person to care. So five more minutes here and then you can ask me your questions. <clears throat> so we talked about how we have to connect it to our heart, but we also need to talk about what solutions look like. And I love sharing good news. And in fact, last year I started a newsletter and the newsletter has a piece of good news right at the top every week. Then it's got a piece of not so good news because we need to know what's happening. And then it has something you can do underneath it. And if you're interested in getting my newsletter, actually, I think I can, yes. You can just go to my website right there and sign up for it. It's free and we do not use your email address for anything else. Um, and it will share good news about what solutions look like. So I love going to Project Drawdown. You can find it easily online at drawdown.org. And they have like little articles on a hundred different climate solutions that I can read and then say, hey, did you know? You can see one picture from BC right there, right? Front and center. I love talking about what countries are doing. There are countries that are doing things and our carbon pricing is part of what we're doing. I love talking about what businesses are doing. It really surprises people. I'm actually speaking with Dell um, this coming week and Dell is doing a lot on climate change and sustainability. It really surprises people to hear that big companies are in, in the game. I love talking about what communities are doing, what army bases are doing or what churches are doing or what farms are doing. It just surprises people to learn how many people are part of this. I love talking about what young people are doing and boy, young people absolutely know how to use their voices. I love talking about what's happening um, in our own lives, how, you know, what the solar panels on our roof look like, um, how we're eating differently because of climate change, the things that I'm doing personally as well. But I know that my personal choices aren't enough. I know that we need to change the system and to change the system, as Bill McKibben says, we have to not be such an individual. We need to use our voice to talk about how we need changes where we live, where we work, where we study, where we worship, Wherever we are part of, we need to use our voice to advocate for the changes we need for all of us. Because I'm truly convinced that climate solutions are the path to a better world. Did you know that 10 million people die prematurely every year from air pollution from burning fossil fuels? 10 million. So climate solutions will give us cleaner air and cleaner water. They help protect us from the disasters that are getting stronger help us grow more food, provide more affordable energy, solar energy, plus batteries, because the sun does not shine at night, is now the cheapest form of electricity in many countries around the world humans have ever known. Reduces our inequalities, makes our cities safer, invests in nature, gives us a more stable world. That giant boulder of climate action is not sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands on it. When we open our eyes to all of the people who are already involved, we realize the giant boulder is already at the top of the hill. It's already rolling down the hill. It already has millions of hands on it. And if we add our hand and we use our voice to encourage others to add theirs, it will go faster. And how do we start? What is that first step? It's something that we're not doing enough of. We're not talking about how climate change affects us and what solutions look like. George Marshall is a British researcher who studies the effectiveness of conversations. He says, talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. Without talking, a group of people can't solve a problem. I mean, it seems so obvious, right? Conversations underpin all of our action, where we invest our money, what party we vote for, what energy source we use at home. How does all of this begin with a conversation? Having conversations plays a huge role in creating social change because we take our cues about what's important from what we hear from people around us. The most effective climate messengers are people we know, not scientists, not leaders, people we know. And the bottom line, as he says, the goal is not to tell people about the ice sheets, the polar bears, the sea level rise. It's to bring people into the conversation. Why do you care? What are you interested in doing? What do you think about that? Climate, having conversations is the first 
domino that knocks over the dominoes to that better future. So when climate changes and we get worried, remember we saw this before, now what do you do? You remember to connect the head to the heart, share how it affects us, and connect the heart to the hands, positive solution. People feel empowered and change results. To go back to the neuroscience, and again, this is not talking about climate change, just talking about how our brains work. Our brain is built to associate forward action with the reward, not avoiding harm. So reframe your message so the information you produce, provide, induces hope, not dread. That is how we fix this. Now, I want to close with one thought. Last year, the IPCC report came out, and I was asked to write an essay for Time magazine. And I decided that I was going to write not about the contents of the report, which was saying how bad it was and how much worse it was getting, but I decided to say, this is what we need. We must act so we can feel hopeful, not the other way around. And when people said, well, why does talking matter? I look back in history, and this is what I realized. I realized that we stand in the shadow of people who used their voices to change the world, and we don't even know who many of those people are. I said, where do we find hope? We find it in action because the world has changed before, and when it did, it was not because a president, a prime minister, a CEO, or a celebrity decided it had to. Change did not begin when the King of England just woke up one morning and said, oh, I'm going to end slavery. That did not happen. Or the President of the United States said, woke up one morning and said, oh, woman really should have the vote. That didn't happen. Or the National Party of South Africa said, oh, sure, let's just end apartheid. It's Friday. That did not happen. When did change happen? It happened when very ordinary people like you and me, people of no particular power or wealth or fame, decided the world could and should be different. Now, there's a few names we know. We know William Wilberforce. We know Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We know Martin Luther King Jr. We know the name of Nelson Mandela. But you know what? There are thousands of others who we don't know. But they shared and supported and fought for the visions of a better world. And they were people who had the courage of their convictions, who used their voices to advocate for the systemic societal changes needed. We are the people who changed the world before and I'm absolutely convinced that we're the people who can change it again. So with that in mind, my last question is, what are we waiting for? Okay, I have one more question for you, then it's time for you to give me your questions. Now, when I say climate change, when you know what you can do and what the first step is and how your voice is just the same as every voice that has ever changed the world before, I want one word on how you feel. Oh, that's a great word. <laughs> I like that. Activated. I like that one too. Resolved. I'm not saying it's easy. And again, I'm not talking about false hope. I'm talking about hope that begins with saying it's bad and it's going to get worse. But if we do everything we can, we know our actions can make a difference. Ooh, militant. I like that one too. That's a good one. <laughs> Encouraged. <coughs> Empowered. All right, these are great words. Okay, so now I'm handing it over to you. So from now on, you can ask me your questions. And here's the fun part. You're gonna enter your questions here into PolyV and here, I'll go to the next one so you can see. You can look at everybody else's questions and you can upvote the questions you most want us to answer. We won't be able to get to all the questions, but we'll get to a lot of them. And what you can do is you can put your question here. It doesn't have to be one word, as many words as you want. But you can also look at everybody else's questions. And you can give them a thumbs up if you want Arnold and I to get to them. So Arnold, why don't we start off, if you have a question that you'd like to start off with, why don't we start off with your question? And then we will go with the questions that people have voted up. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. We really appreciate your time spending with us this evening. and. Uh, lots of it's great that change from you know discouraged to hope that I think happened with the way that you asked the question at the beginning and at the end. Um, so yeah, uh, I do have a question, um, and 
This comes from probably social media interactions with some of my friends through COVID. Um, and and uh, you mentioned uh, um, carbon taxes and uh, revenue neutral carbon taxes are likely among the easiest and most effective responses to climate change, I think, in terms of what governments can do. Maybe you could address that. But my friends who didn't like the government restrictions during COVID aren't interested in being told what to do now. Like you're going to pay these taxes. How do we make progress when government mandates, taxes are government mandates, turn people off? And in addition to that, uh, science, distrust in science is so widespread. So that's my question. Uh, well, Arnold, that's not, <laughs> that's probably a re the really, really tough question. And if I knew the full answer to that question, I think that would really help. Um, COVID did climate change no favors for the two reasons you just put your finger on. First of all, the science was evolving so fast. It was being done in real time. Remember how old climate science is? We've known the cause of this problem since the 1850s. So we've had, you know, not quite, but almost I mean, 170 years to study this and really sort of cross the T's and dot the I's. Whereas the COVID science was being done on the fly in a matter of weeks and months. So because of that, because it was being done on the fly, you know, one study found this, one study found that, people were saying, wash your vegetables, then you don't have to wash your vegetables anymore. And there's just a, was a lot of confusion that led people to be like, oh, those people don't even know what they're talking about. And then obviously, in most countries around the world, there were also government mandates on what you could and couldn't do that in, in many cases, people felt like affected them negatively. So here we have climate change. And we know, first of all, that the science has been around for a very long time. We know why it's happening, we know how it's affecting us, and we can see it today. We also know what to do. And it turns out that almost every economist around the world, including the two who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, agree putting a price on carbon is the most effective thing to do because it offsets the subsidies on fossil fuels. What people don't realize is people think it's like a level playing field and then there's a tax on carbon. Mm -mm. It is not a level playing field. Fossil fuels are subsidized in 2021. They were subsidized to the tune of $11 million US per minute. And then by 2022, they were subsidized to the tune of $16 million US per minute around the world. So the playing field is heavily stacked in the favor of fossil fuels. And what a price on carbon does is it levels it to an actual level market or free market. We also know too, that that's a way of putting that price on the carbon damages they're causing. And here in Canada, what a lot of people don't realize in Canada is you do get money back, especially if you're in a lower income bracket. And that is the way that it needs to be. Like you just said, Arnold, it needs to be revenue neutral. You can't penalize the people who are being most affected by climate change by the solutions to climate change. You need to be using that carbon pricing, carbon tax to invest in public transportation, to invest in low income housing and making it more efficient, to invest in helping make people more resilient to climate impacts. What we really need to do is we're not focusing on, first of all, again, how it's affecting us where we live and we're not and, and why, why it matters to us. And we're not focusing on the benefits that the solutions can bring to us. There's a lot of discussion of the stuff that we don't agree on, but there isn't a, stuff, a lot of discussion over the stuff that we do agree on. Um, I see people putting stuff in the chat. Um, Tim, you don't download the app. There's no downloads. You just go, you just click on the link and you just go to um, uh, polyv.com slash Catherine. Um, on the internet. But again, people want to push the discussion to the abstract level, and they want to push the discussion to this solution doesn't work. Let's bring the solution, the discussion down to the concrete level and what solutions do work and are making a difference today in our lives. So the top voted question right now, I'll, I'll read it to you, Catherine. What can you say to someone who accepts climate science but just thinks that pragmatically using fossil fuels has so much so many benefits for humanity including the poor that it's actually worth it mm -hmm. so uh, this is a question i've asked myself and in fact i have a global weirding i have a youtube series called global weirding um i have a global weirding episode that actually answers this question this exact question so i'm going to put a link in the chat there if you're interested <laughs> it'll give you a bit of a longer answer to that question but the bottom line is I hear this a lot because there are 700 million people in the world, many of them in Sub-Saharan Africa, who live in energy poverty. And the single factor that is most highly correlated with human well-being is access to electricity. 
not energy in general, but specifically electricity. That is most highly correlated with lifting people out of poverty. And so people say, well, how dare we say to poor countries that they can't do it the way we did? I turn it around and I say, how dare we say to poor countries that they have to do it the way we did 200 years ago? It's like saying, oh, well, you don't get cell phones yet. You get the party line telephone because that's what we had 100 years ago. 200 years ago, all we had was coal. 100 years ago, all we had was oil. We hadn't figured out how to get abundant electricity from, well, we were figuring out pretty quickly in Canada how to get it from hydro. Not everybody's as fortunate as we are, but in terms of, of not only hydro, but solar, geothermal, wind, energy from streams, energy from the tides, storage of that energy for when it's not blowing or flowing, we know now that we can get electricity some a different way. And it turns out that solar is booming in Africa because did you know that most of the countries who live in the most abject poverty today, they don't have fossil fuels. So if we're saying that they have to develop the way we did 200 years ago, we're actually saying you have to buy it from us. And that's what China's doing. They're going into low-income countries and they are building coal-fired power plants at very low prices in order that those countries will have to be buying their coal from China for the next 30 years to outsource their air pollution. Because as I mentioned, air pollution is responsible for 10 million premature deaths around the world every year. So when somebody says, don't we still need fossil fuels? I say, and you'll see I say that in that video, I am genuinely grateful for the benefits that fossil fuels have brought us. If I think about what my life would have been like 200 years ago, it would have been short. The average lifespan 200 years ago in the UK, which back then was the most developed country in the world, was 40 years, 200 years ago. Think of what your life would be like without electricity, without mobility, without the access to the energy. Think of what our education system would be like. Think about what our medical system would be like. I am truly profoundly grateful for the benefits and even the blessings that fossil fuels have brought us. But just as we no longer need formula when we grow up, in the same way, it's time to say thank you and move on because now we're at a point where the detrimental impacts of fossil fuels outweigh the benefits. In terms of air pollution and in terms of climate change, it's putting us all at risk. And that only way to the better future today is to use everything we've gotten from fossil fuels in the past to help power that transition to a clean energy economy for the future. So the next question we're going to ask here is about priorities. So um, it's about um, what's the most pressing issue today? A lot of people are really pressed by current economic conditions, uh, inflation, housing costs, interest rates. Mm. Um, I know that during COVID, you know, for me, COVID was a more pressing issue, it seems, than, than climate change. And so most of my communication, science-related uh, communication for the public was, was around COVID. And then I figured when this COVID dies out, we'll, we'll talk more about climate change. Well, it hasn't necessarily happened yet, but um, how, do we, how do we think about climate change in terms of all the other pressing issues that we have these days? This is a really good question. I'm so glad it was asked and upvoted because this is a really key concept. So often people think of climate change as one more bucket. So here's all the buckets of things I'm worried about. I'm worried about inflation or the cost of housing or interest rates or <clears throat> feeding my family or the war in Ukraine or, you know, here's all the issues I'm worried about. And here's one more, it's climate change. I just don't have any energy. I don't have any time left over for that bucket. I hear you, we have enough buckets in our life, right? Well, here's something I've learned that completely changed my perspective. Climate change is not a separate bucket. Climate change is the whole in every other bucket. The US military actually has a specific term for this. They call climate change a threat multiplier. So in other words, it takes the problems we already have and it multiplies them. It's not creating a new problem we've never had before. It's taking something that already existed and making it worse. So for example, look at poverty. <clears throat> and COVID is very similar to climate change in this respect too. Climate change is already amplifying the economic gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world. Since the 1960s, climate change has pushed the richest and poorest countries further apart by 25%. And COVID pushed even more people into poverty. So if you're worried about poverty, you care about climate change because climate change is the hole in the bucket. You can't fix poverty if you don't fit mend the hole in the bucket. What about hunger? 
We know that climate change has, since the 1980s, been leading to $5 billion worth in crop losses every year on average, some years much higher than that, most of them in low-income countries, where when people can't feed their families, often the only choice they have is to sell a daughter as young as eight years old into marriage. We cannot fix hunger if we don't fix climate change. What about access to clean water? Millions of people die every year from polluted water, many of them under the age of five. Increased heavy rainfall from climate change is increasing water pollution. We can't fix that issue if we don't fix climate change. And like I just said, people often say, well, what about the 700 million people who don't have access to energy and they need electricity? They do. But if we just make them dependent on high income countries to purchase their energy from us, that is not going to fix the problem either. They need affordable electricity that they can generate with their own resources in their own country, in their own states, provinces, regions, and homes. We're not going to fix our problems. We're not going to get to a better future if we don't fix climate change. It is the hurdle we have to get over on our way to these issues. So whatever issue people have, <clears throat> whether it's housing, whether it's jobs, whether it's whatever it is, nine times out of 10, you can find a connection to climate change. In fact, I got a call from a reporter um, a couple of weeks ago, and he was from Reuters in the States. And he said, this is gonna be the weirdest call you've ever had. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I had a lot of weird ones. And he's like, well, I want to ask you, do you think climate change is having an impact on tax season? I said, well, that's not weird at all. Back in the 1980s, there was $1 billion weather and climate disaster in the US every four months. Now there's one every three weeks. And every time there's a big disaster, that whole state gets like a month waiver on when to file their taxes. So of course it's affecting tax season. He's like, oh, so it wasn't a weird question. I'm like, no. So there's a connection to almost anything because climate change is a whole in pretty much every bucket. Even with COVID, you know, Arnold, because they showed that people who had been exposed to air pollution from, from breathing air pollution from fossil fuels, they were much more likely to get COVID and much more likely to become very sick from COVID than if they had not been exposed to air pollution from burning fossil fuels. So there's even a connection there. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, just for those of you who are not sure about this, there will be a recording of this posted on the CSEA's uh, YouTube channel. And uh, someone has asked about saving all of the links that we've got here. So um, we're going to save the chat and make sure that everybody who's on this call gets those links. And we'll all work with Catherine on getting that out there. Um, the next question comes from someone who you met at COP27. I think that's probably Sarah, a Trinity Western uh, student. Uh, she's asking a question about the youth. What can the youth do? What can? What are some ways that youth can help combat anxiety about our futures and that of our children? As you saw from the poll results, young people, far and away, not just in Canada, but all around the world, are very worried about climate change. And young people have voices, and gosh, they know how to use them. <laughs> in fact, I feel like I've learned so much on how to use your voice effectively on social media from young people. But don't forget that hope follows action. So when you feel anxious, first of all, it's a logical response to what's happening. Second of all, you are not alone. Many, in fact, the majority of people feel anxious and worried. But third, the antidote to anxiety is action. Do something, anything, and talk about it. Get together with your friends and do something about it. I teach a class where I take my students through, I use my global weirding videos and I take my students through the whole understanding of, you know, first of all, critical thinking and then understanding the sciencey sounding arguments against climate change and then understanding the impacts, connecting to the heart, to the hands, and then what you can do. And then at the end, I ask my students, so, you know, reflect on what, you're, what you learned in this class and what you're gonna do. And all of their reflections are completely different. One student says, I didn't realize what a big role the fashion industry plays. I'm very conscious of fashion. I'm gonna be organizing clothes swaps from now on. And then another student's like, well, I'm becoming a teacher. I'm gonna be telling all my middle school students about why this matters and what they can do. And then somebody else says, well, I come from a farming family. I learned a lot about regenerative agriculture from the readings in your class. We're gonna start implementing some different practices on our farm. So whoever you do, you can do something different. We all are part of a circle, a unique circle that nobody else touches. But it all begins with using your voice to talk about, hey, here's why it matters. Here's something that we might be able to do. And again, there's so many different things. That's why I've started to do this newsletter where every week I have good news, not so good news, and something that you can do about to make a difference. I'll put another link to that newsletter in here if you're interested. So now a politics kind of question. This is true both in the US and Canada, I think. Right-leaning parties supported by Christians often 
are so much more unwilling than than more left leaning parties uh, to initiate climate action policies. Why why is that? And what hope do we have about uh, changing that? So in the United States, when you break people out demographically, the two groups of people who are least concerned about climate change, and don't worry, I'll get to Canada too, I'm just introducing the states first. The two groups of people who are least concerned about climate change are white evangelical Protestants and white Catholics. So that often leads people to believe that there's something about what Christians believe that would cause them to be skeptical of climate change. Whereas in fact, it's exactly the opposite. If you look at Genesis one, it says God gave humans responsibility over every living thing on this earth. If you look at the book of Revelation, it says God will destroy those who destroy the earth. If you look at everything in between, it talks about God's love and care for the most seemingly insignificant aspects of creation and how we Christians are supposed to be recognized by our love for others. And when others are being impacted by what's happening to our planet, again, is the most unloving thing in the world to say, oh, you're just making it up. Your house was ruined by a hurricane, no big deal, doesn't matter. Oh, you can't feed your family, ah, pray. Absolutely not. That runs counter to everything we believe. <clears throat> so how did this issue become politicized? It turns out that when they break this down, it has nothing to do with where you do or, do or don't go to church on Sunday morning. It has everything to do with where you fall on the political spectrum. But in the United States, since the revolution, this is not new, it got kickstarted in the 1980s um, into overdrive, but it started back in the American Revolution. There has been an increasing association between conservative politics and the Christian faith in the United States. And there's an excellent book that if you have not read it, I highly recommend called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Mark Knoll just did a um, updated edition last year. I haven't had a chance to read the updated edition yet. And it tracks, he's a historian at Notre Dame, it tracks the whole history of the confluence between politics and Christian faith in the United States with some very much appreciated side notes on how Canada is different. I really appreciate his side notes. It got kicked into overdrive in the 1980s. There, thank you, there's the link right there. And what has happened is it has started to seep, this polarization has started to seep into Canada and elsewhere. I have colleagues with Arasha in France who have actually tracked climate denial in Christian circles in France back to its original source. Do you know where it comes from every single time? The United States. So many of our materials come from the United States that the climate denial is just creeping through it into us and our churches and even our politics. A thermometer is not red, blue, purple, green, or orange. It does not give you a different answer depending on how you vote. We need every party to have good solutions to climate change. I want every single one of our parties to have good solutions and I want them to argue about who has the best solution. And then when we go to vote, I want us to try to decide who has the best solution. That's what I want. I don't want it to be one or two or three parties that have solutions and the other parties pretend like it's not real. I want everybody to have great solutions to climate change because there is no one perfect solution. We need all the ideas on board. Where did this come from? It came from what I was talking about at the very beginning. 70% of this whole problem was caused by 90 companies. And those 90 companies were the richest companies in the world for over 100 years. And when they saw that this was, it was becoming a real issue in the 1990s, they decided, you know what? It's a lot easier if we just pay off some fake scientists and some politicians to say it's not a big deal. And that's what they did. And there is a really good book and movie about that called Merchants of Doubt. Highly recommend watching that documentary and or reading that book. So they deliberately manufactured doubt and they deliberately manipulated people to make it a polarized issue. When the reality is, if you're a human being living on this planet, you have every reason you need to care. And if you take the Bible seriously, I believe that we'll be at the front of the line demanding climate action because of who we are and who God has made us. Um, one more question here, maybe another one yet. Um, is it, let's see, where did it go? Uh, do our small choices really make a big difference in our country or even globally when big fossil fuel companies in places like China or in the Middle East aren't changing their habits or doing enough to make a difference globally? You just mentioned how like the 90 or 88 biggest com companies are effectively responsible for 30% of the forest fire uh, area and so forth. So 
do our small choices really make a big enough impact over all of those big impacting companies? It actually just reminded me there's a brand new book that just came out that I'm halfway through reading called The Petroleum Papers, and it's about Canada. So I'm going to put that the Merchants of Doubt is about the American companies. The Petroleum Papers is about Canadian companies, specifically how Imperial Oil, this is just one little gem. Oh, yeah. Stephen's putting good resources in the chat there, too. Here's one little gem. Imperial Oil, back in the Mulroney days, calculated that if we put a price on carbon, Canada would meet its Kyoto target. Back there, we had a Kyoto target. No problem with the price on carbon. Totally successful. Greenhouse gas emissions would decline, would begin the transition to clean energy back in the 90s. They calculated that would happen. So what did they do? They decided to lobby as hard as they could against carbon pricing, and they were very successful for 25 years. So that's just one example of how those companies did the research, saw what was coming, and made a very cold-blooded decision that we, the rest of us, are all paying for. <clears throat> so, okay, so back to the, do, do small things matter? So, so th this is why, this is the second reason I wrote my book. So the first reason I wrote the book was to answer the question, what gives us hope? But then the second reason is to answer the question, um, what can I do? And I'll just put in, here's a Faith Today article about the book if you're interested. Um, and you can get it at Indigo or Chapter or wherever, or your library. Um, because I, I take actions, and you do too, right, Arnold? I mean, we all do things to make a difference, but then you hear about these companies or these, you know, airlines or whatever, just doing these things and you just think, well, it completely negates everything I did. So I thought, what's the point? And I realized the point is several. First of all, our actions matter to us. When I do something, it gives me hope. Second of all, our actions can be contagious. How can they be contagious? when we talk about them or when we do them where other people can see them. So in my book, I talk about how when I first got a plug-in car, I left it plugged in outside because we didn't have a plug in the garage. And all the neighbors, and this is living in Texas, they all stopped. And if, if they saw us outside, they would like stop and they'd actually get out of their car. And they'd be like, what is that? <laughs> I'd say it's an electric car. And they'd be like, where did you get it? <laughs> and they said, does it have a gas pedal? <laughs> <laughs> How much did it cost? And then when we saw them again, they'd roll down their window because it's Texas, so they had the air conditioning on. So they'd roll down the window and they lean out and they'd be like, I love your car. <laughs> so, so that's a way to actually make the change contagious. And when I was doing the research for my book, I learned that solar panels are literally contagious. The number one predictor of whether a house has solar panels is whether another home within about one and a half kilometers has solar panels too. So when we got solar panels in our house in Lubbock, Texas, it was so rare that we actually had to have like the head guy from the energy company come out to set up the meter because hardly anybody had these. Within a year, three other people who we didn't know within two blocks of our house had solar panels. And a bunch of people were asking about their businesses. They would actually say, oh, I heard that you did this. You know, do you think we could do it for our business? So that makes a difference too. But what also makes a difference is when we use our voice to talk about how, hey, if I'm doing this, why aren't we doing this? If I'm doing this, why isn't our church doing this? If I'm doing this, why isn't our school or our university doing this? If I'm doing this, why isn't our business doing this? How about our city? Why aren't we doing this? It's really effective when we use our voice to talk about what we're doing, about what others are doing, and about what we can all do together. And people often say, well, how do we change the biggest companies? How do we change the biggest banks that are financing fossil fuel extraction? How do we change the biggest oil companies? There's multiple ways. First of all, there are people working, I can guarantee you, because I've met people at every one of those organizations from the inside making a difference. Then there are people who are deliberately purchasing shares in those companies to show up for the shareholder meetings to force them to adopt climate resolutions. Then there are people who are divesting. They feel like they wouldn't have a voice, and so they're actually divesting, taking their money out so it's not supporting those organizations or those banks. Then there's people who are protesting. Then there's people who are using their voice to share, hey, have you considered doing this instead? And then there's people who are helping to change policy and your vote helps to change policy, which will then force those organizations and companies to change. There's so many ways that we can do this. And when we do it, again, how do we amplify it? We amplify it by that tiny little step that's so basic that we don't even think about it, talking about it. Sharing with people what we did and why. 
And indeed, talking about it is is uh, what you highlighted as one of the main things we can do. And and I just want to go one or two minutes over by asking this this last question. Someone is going to be facilitating uh, a com- helping facilitate a community community dialogue on climate change resiliency. What are some concrete positive actions you can ask interested and concerned citizens to take besides just talking about it? Oh, that's great. I love that. I love I love lists. So on my website, for example, I have like lists of things churches can do. And then um, there's many lists of things that cities can do. Um, and I think it'd be great to also have lists of things that I know these lists exist. I just need to collect them. Um, lists, for example, that homeowners can do. So a big thing that we can do that I didn't touch on at all is when we use, we can use nature to become more resilient to climate change. How do we do that? Well, it turns out that nature is absolutely phenomenal at helping to protect us from flood and from heat. So in big urban cities, when heat waves come, and they're even happening here now too, it's not just a you know US thing, low income neighborhoods typically have a lot less green space than higher income neighborhoods. But, and so as a result, they can be seven or eight degrees Celsius hotter during a heat wave than higher income neighborhoods. So helping to plant community gardens, parks, trees, especially in lower income neighborhoods, shades them, but it also filters the air for air pollution too. A win-win provides green space for communities and people to go outside, also helps their physical and mental health. Green spaces, we can use nature also to absorb floodwaters. Now I'm not talking about the crazy atmospheric rivers (laughs) that you had a year and a half ago. There's not enough nature to absorb all of that, but in general, heavy rainfall is getting more frequent. And when we replace concrete with permeable surfaces in the city of Houston, they're actually installing sidewalks that the water goes right through and they've got drains under the sidewalks to take those into their bayous. And when we put in green spaces and what about pollinator friendly gardens? What about native plants to help support biodiversity? Because biodiversity is part of what nurtures life on this planet too. And climate change is threatening biodiversity. So um, I was talking to a New York Times reporter a, um, a couple of years ago, and I said, and she said, what should I be doing more of? And I said, you should be telling stories of solutions that people can do. And so she kept that in her head and she was walking to work one day and she passed in New York City, a tiny little garden, front garden that was just full of native flowers and pollinator friendly plants. Like it just stood out like a, not a sore thumb, like a green thumb from the surrounding area. And she's like, that's exactly what what we were talking about, like small solutions that people can do that really do make a difference. It makes a difference for biodiversity, makes a difference for mental and physical health, makes a difference for extreme heat and makes a difference for absorbing the water. So she knocked on the man's door and she said, excuse me, I couldn't help noticing that you have this incredible, natural, diverse, you know, garden full of um, plant, native plants and insects. Why? And he said, well, I'm a, I'm an ecologist and I'm a Catholic. And I'm very worried about climate change and the biodiversity crisis. And I wanted to do something that I personally could do. So this is what I did. So Kara wrote a story about it in the New York Times. And it was one of the most liked and shared stories in the New York Times. As opposed to all the disaster and burning and flood. Because it showed people that you can make a difference. And how many people decided to redo their lawns after they read that article? I have no idea, but I imagine it was very many. So we truly can catalyze change by knocking over that first domino, which is a combination of doing something and talking about it. Amen. And thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call here is uh, very appreciative of your time and expertise and your passion and your heart and your talking about these things. And uh, we will definitely have you here in Vancouver in the future uh, for another visit, hopefully uh, to Swallowfield Farm or to Trinity Western or Regent or Arosha um, or UBC Graduate and Faculty Christian Forum. Any one of us would be uh, very happy to host you. And we look forward to seeing you uh, again and we'll be watching your work and everyone here will be reading your book if they haven't already. And uh, we'll be sharing these links and uh, and talking about climate change. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. And thank you, uh, Catherine, God bless. Thank you, everyone. It's great being with you. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you, GD Rick. Thank you, everybody, for hosting. Bye.